Thank you. Uh, once again, I want to share the word of God with us. My name is Elfa Zubire. By God's grace, I'm the senior pastor here. And we thank God that he has allowed us to gather this very first Sunday of the month of February, the year 2023. Our theme for some of us who are visiting us, or maybe you've been away for a long time, is that in his presence, we want to encounter God. We want to walk with him both in his word and in his spirit, and we trust that he's going to help us. So we've been doing a theme exposition the whole month of January, and last week we said we want to do some recap of some few lessons in Encounter One, which we feel are very pertinent for us to walk with God, and our Deputy Senior Pastor Reverend Patrick began us on understanding the attributes of God, the person of the Holy Spirit and the person of God, and I want to proceed today looking at God's attributes because you cannot walk with a person you don't know. That is why you see now Elder is describing, describing his wife. And there are many attributes that goes with a person who you know. And so our main text is going to be from the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 to 17. I'll read up to verse 18, and then I will make some few inferences again from the book of um, John chapter 15, from verse 1 all the way to verse 5, which we have gone through for many of us who have been consistent. God's attributes, God's attributes. Um, uh, Paul writes to the Philippians from verse 10 that I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the death. Then verse 12, I don't mean to say, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let, us, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you but we must hold on the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from these things. Uh, learn from those who follow our example. Verse 18, for I have told you often before, I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are, really, they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. Let's again read the book of John, chapter 15, verse 1 to 5. We've read there many times. We should be ready to memorize this, but uh, just me, allow me to be able to remind. The Bible says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they may produce even more. Verse 3, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That is the word of God. I saw another sharing on social media recently. I looked for that photo when I was making my summer note. I didn't get it. But somebody was putting up a scarecrow. A scarecrow is for some of us who do farming and we come from a region of farming. That you want to scare some birds from coming and eat maybe your fruits or there could be trees that are flowering. So you put a scarecrow to scare the birds to go away so that they will not eat your produce. And so, 
the birds from that drawing, for many of you who saw it, shows that the scarecrow was drawn because he wanted to be modern, of a person with an iPad, or an i it looks like an iPhone, either of the two. And so, um, it doesn't show any of those scarecrow looking at the iPad. And so the birds came, they came and they looked, and they say, he's not looking at the iPad, he's not looking at the iPhone. And they say, that is not a human being. They are not looking at their iPhones. So the birds went ahead and ate the plants. You know, for us to be alive in this generation, there is an interaction that demonstrates our attributes, that we are humans. Even now, some of us must check on our phones and iPad after every two minutes, after 30 minutes. And so, the birds knew there was just a scarecrow. And they aim and did whatever they do. Today, as we look at us going to God, God is not a scarecrow, that we come to make a prayer like a presentation. He acts, in fact, he prunes you. He says, if you don't produce fruits, in fact, he says he chops off. Some Bible says he chops off. He is very active on his gadgets, and we are his gadgets, praise the Lord. This is what I'm putting across. We are not walking in the presence just to be able to put something here. We want to encounter God this year. Amen. We trust there is a God who lives. He has power. And he says, and when Paul writes that I want to know his power in the resurrection, and he says, even there are some who are not mature, but there are things that will be revealed to him. So God has an interaction with us. And that is a subject that I will be looking at when you look at the God's attributes, the things that define our God. Just like a farmer would want to protect himself from birds, he would put something. The birds will know whether there is a human being or a resemblance of a human being. That is not a human being. Amen. And so God is actively involved in our lives. And we must know him. We must know him. And we must know, when we know him, we know our behavior. You will learn and eat the sunflower. You check na mnaena sema hapo mungu yuko. Na kaa pale kama mtoto wa king, I eat in Jesus' name. Amen. Then when you realize this, there's no God, you don't go there. So the birds knew that. A story that you go and ponder about. An attribute is defined from the dictionary as a quality looked upon as naturally or necessarily belonging to somebody or something. Like I would say now that your iPad must blink. There is a day we were working here and one of my phone fell directly and it just went off. A little touch could not come on. So there is an attribute that makes your phone to be alive. There is something that describes you as a person. As attribute. So that is what the dictionary says. So it's for example, mercy is an attribute of God. God is merciful. He chooses who to forgive. He has power of mercy on us. That is an attribute of God. Okay? Politeness is an attribute of a gentleman. You know, that is an attribute that you would say. So an attribute is natural, is is, is a natural or necessarily uh, or, or a necessary quality. It's, it's both natural or unnecessary qualities. You cannot dispute a certain attribute of certain people. You will define them and you will know them, okay? Some of you can be able to know whether the gentleman is coming, a certain voice of certain person. That is an attribute you know. And it identifies us and it affects our, res our response and our interaction. So God, or God's attributes are at the essence of who he is. The essence is you touch God, you know he's God. When you go to the presence of God, you know this is my God. This is our God. It's the essence. It is what composed him. If you ate a mango, you know this is a mango or a complete of a mango. Psalm chapter 117 verse 2 talks about that, the essence of our God. Our God is person. Our God has relational, he relates with us. He changes things. One of the things that I will be hinging on is God's power that he is able to change things, is able to influence things. God's attributes are absolute. They are no relative. God's attributes are absolute and they are unchanging. God, in essence, cannot become praised. He is who he is. In fact, one of the things when I was trying to think of what to put as a series we ran, we could just talk about the God who I am. He told Abraham that I am who I am. 
And he says that even in John chapter this, he's absolute. God does not change. When the world changes and thinks that some people who look to be female can be male, for God, he remains to be our God. He remains true to his word. And that is a very great attribute that we need to able to understand. It's not that you come and check and say, this God has moved, so I can also move my position. He is the God that was, he is, and will be. Personal attributes, we, they, they can, God has the two attributes that he can be categorized, the personal attributes and the relational attributes. These personal attributes, uh, attributes include those do with intrinsic nature, such as unchanging. It is within him. You can't change them. Such as power, wisdom, knowledge. While the relational attributes are those that have to do with how he relates with his people and may include his love, his mercy. So this morning or this afternoon, I'll be looking at how his personal attributes influences how he relates with us. Because it's powerful, he has power to forgive. Because it's powerful, he can change your direction. Because it's powerful, he will make the enemies when they are coming to go away. And if we will understand who God is, then we will seek him over our circumstances. We are not dying, men, you know, we are dying or sometimes we suffer and say, Kufa kama mwanaume. What it means for those who don't understand English is, suffer like a gentleman. Now we want to go to God and say, God, we are seeking you and we are crying to you and he will relate with us and he will be able to help us. So God has power. Paul writes and he says that I may know his power of resurrection. And that power of resurrection draws people to him and makes these people to relax, to, to do what? To, to relate with him. So God relational attributes, one of the things is that God influences people. Even you here, you will be influenced by people. One of our senior clergy at one point says that when he gave his life to Christ, he struggled in this thing of what Rev was trying to put, was preaching to us last week, being filled with the Holy Spirit. He just thought, when God, I come into a person, I just become a good gentleman, I seek you and you go home. So in a prayer meeting, and people were praying and they were praying, and you know there are people who pray over time. Because they know they are God. They would go extra. And so when he was seated there and people were being prayed for, he only remembered that after a while he was carried aside and was saying, you are speaking in tongues and you are rolling. And he said, God interacted with people. God changed him in a twinkle of an eye. Paul the author, who actually writes Philippians and many other books in the New Testament, was once a persecutor of people. But at one point, God changes him in a radical transformation from Saul to Paul, from a persecutor to the preacher. He changes him in a twinkle of an eye, and Paul decides to follow God forever. His power to change people. Amen. Men who are here, women who are here, and all children who are here, God has power to change many of us. Some of us have behavior at home, and parents have said, you cannot be number one. God can change your number one. He changes people. A one who was not a disciplined boy will stand and be able to preach. The other day I was reading a story. I don't know where it was. I read so many things. From Zay who was a drunkard. And the family conspired and took him into a mortuary. And he was told that when he rises up, let him be told that he's in heaven. And my friend, he rose up and he was told, don't joke, you're in heaven. We will strike you. Go back and sleep there. So he slept there for three days because he was threatened. I read that story somewhere. And for three days when he was released and prayed for, he never went again to drink. Now, God can do a radical transformation for many people. A mere experience that can change a totally different person you thought they cannot be of essence. Elder has talked about our children who are here. God has power to do that. God has power to change your boss. God has power to change your neighbors. You know, some of us have neighbors, but we don't sit eye to eye. God has power to control people. In this, we are saying that he appoints 
leaders for his own purposes. Romans chapter 9, verse 17. In his power, God appoints people. God has not relegated power. While things may seem to be, because human beings, we err. We could select and choose, choose people that are not wanted, but in God, he can lay hands on them and allow them to serve his purpose. And I was saying in the first service, look at the story of Esau and Jacob. For many of you think that Jacob sneaked his um, his uh, way out, you know. But God goes ahead and allows him to lead. Praise the Lord. He appoints them. Because for him, it is not even the people. He has a purpose to serve. He has a mission in vision to his people. So he was allowed to sit them and allow them to lead and we see his glory. Because the earth and everything in, he, in, the, in the earth belong to him. That is Psalms 24. God, in the ability and the power as he relates to people, has power to actually harden the hearts of leaders. Exodus chapter 14, verse 8, the Bible says, and he hardened the hearts of Pharaoh. So no one should take Pharaoh to court for being able to re be with, able to do what? To deny the Israelites to move. There are some of your tormentors who are God has sent. And you as a child of God in this year, I want to tell you, you need to understand God. God is not leaving you to suffer. He is in control. And he has allowed some people. In fact, the Bible says he, ended, he hardened Pharaoh more harder. Okay? And then when he released them, he says, so that they may know that I have released them. Look at the power of God. And this will be very good for you to understand as you get into the year. Because some people could be as quick as now testifying how God has done very soft things for them and have breakthrough. But some of you, you as who delay, I don't say amen, but I can dare tell you, by the fact that God has powers that are unchanging, he can make some of you to wait longer and then give you an ultimate testimony. Because he has power, he is sovereign, he walks with us. Amen? So he has power over that and he relates with us. So even some of us, our children, you know some of us, I was saying in the first service that we have known what people are saying, character development. God can do character development on you. Even some of your children, they can become. He wants to know how you relate with him and disciple this child that is becoming difficult. Some of our children who are here, they could be a little bit older. You think that your parents are hard, but some of these hard parents are going to produce very disciple, disciplined children. I have one of my friends, when they called by the, their parents, they are older than me, they are always coming in terms of their age groups. Discipline in that house is of highest order. Musezi wa kucheza, bara amefanya watoto wa mekua mungine ni mwanajeshi. In fact, he will always be promoted quickly because he follows law because he has been following it at home. God ordained a commander at home, head of home, to be able to discipline him. God has ability to harden hearts of many people. Many of us who will lead on different teams. You may have that particular boss or that particular team member who is always differing on your board meetings. It's God said, praise the Lord. Amen. The CEOs here and the governance people. It is God that hardens the hearts of leaders. Now, the other thing that we want to look at in 2 Chronicles, which I'm not reading, 36, 23, we see that God also directs leaders. His ability to show the way that things that are worse or bad, he can make human beings have solutions. He has that ability. As you walk in his presence this year, also understand the ability that God relates with us. He tells you, walk here, my son. Walk here, my daughter. Some of us maybe are struggling with behavioral habits in this year. In fact, the best thing to do is to fast longer. Those when they need to be given three days in blocks of every quarter. You will deal with some of your addictions in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. You go just before him and say, God, I am surrendering before you. Show me your way. I'm always getting money. There are people when they get money, they just pass through. I have a friend of mine. When money comes, he just as much as it means it is. Today he earns, tomorrow is broke. You can go before God and he will direct your finances. Some of us, our behaviors, in the sense how we, we behave, you just find yourself, you know, Pastor was saying that could be that even some people come to this church and drunk it. You never go to the bar, but you're always finding yourself in the bar. I want to tell you, God can direct you to the right place. <laughs> you are always being misled. Unaamuka tu unasema, nasijui nilifika hajab. 
Some of us are like that. You have a desire. There is the power that Paul desires to see, the power of his resurrection. This comes to us to know who is our God and how he relates with us. You know, God, when he changes people, he can also change circumstances. Amen? There are circumstances in our lives that we, we go through. God can change them. I said in the first service, it doesn't mean that a child that is born in the streets as an orphan will not learn. God can change the circumstance and the, 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 the opportunity for that child. For your information, the Bible says in Psalms 27 verse 10 that even though your father and mother will reject you, the Lord will receive you. For many of you who are teachers, we have bright children that are in school. If you would dare send them home, they will never come back. But at one point, God in his miraculous way allows some teachers to allow them to learn. I pray some of you become that. And God changes the circumstances of those children. When I was in school, actually, it's my principal that ensured I learned. But one day he wanted to, to send me home and he said, this guy does not pay school fees. So he would actually just escape. That time the school bursary used to come through the head teacher. The guy was not born again. And he changed my fortune. I finished school, I went and worked hard labor on my, with my hands and paid school fees. God can change a circumstance. Some of us are going through difficult circumstances. In his presence, one of the things I want to tell you about God in his essence, he is fully powerful to change every circumstance. He can overturn things. Okay? I was just overhearing. He can overturn things so that A grade, you get another one. For some of you who did form for last year, let me tell you, it doesn't matter what you've had. God can change the circumstance. Those who God is, I don't know whether E's or F's now, those who are in college, F's. God is able to change that and transform that. You need to know that God has power to change every circumstance. Gen Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 to uh, 20, please. I want us to read this. This is very fundamental to reinforce this point. When Joseph was actually looking at his circumstance, many of you know the story about Joseph. God changed this man from a prisoner to a prime minister. It's quite very interesting. In the last chapter of Genesis, which is Genesis chapter 50, um, said Moses, the author of this uh, writes these words verse, from verse 19. He says, but Joseph replied, do not be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended all good. He intended it all for good. He brought me out of, uh, me up. It brought me, I'm reading from New Translation Version, uh, New Living Translation. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. God changed the circumstance of Joseph. Joseph, a prisoner, to a prime minister. Joseph, a man that was doomed to a testifier. So God in his power has relates with us. He has power to change. So he's not a scarecrow. You know, some of us go before God and you pray, Jesus, I have heard people. Let, let's pray passionately that God is interacting with us. You are the iPad. is touching you and you are responding. It's types A. It produces A music. It's an interaction like you see here. He changes circumstances. He changes your fortunes. And that's why we are seeking him and praying for breakthrough in our life. We just come from a meeting with Bishop the other day and he asked us if we have ever dared, our senior, to pray for somebody who is dead come to life. I don't know why he asked us. He was trying to say, any one of us who has ever prayed for the dead to come to life? And uh, it took like two minutes, and he was serious, he needed an answer. So somebody two well, raised up their hand, and say, but they didn't rise up. <laughs> but is it biblical that God can raise the dead? That he can actually change a dead situation to life? It is very true. It actually gave us more time because along the way as he was closing and he was telling us because we didn't know where he was standing in his asking. He said, some of us are living in fear and God has appointed you as Christians to do the things that God wants you to do. So you are always fearing that God can change the circumstance. Some of us have sicknesses that you have never dared to pray to God to heal you. Some of us have been trusting God for babies and you have never dared because you feel it's a stigma. Some of us have been having all manner of things, but we believe that it is okay 
we are meant to be that way. I want to preach to you this particular afternoon. When we look at God and walking in his presence, he changes circumstances. Say amen. amen. You are not meant to be a person of that particular position forever. Some of you are due to retire and you have never received an increment. It is not the desire of God. He changes that in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of us have been in school, the young children who are here, and you just believe I am just meant to be between 30 and 40. We used to be in schools, that number was good, because we used to be 181 in our school. So I remember being number 79. Ah, it was great, my friend. But that is not God, that's not what God wants us to be. You could be in a multitude of many people and you feel it's okay because you have defeated over 100. By the way, 31 out of 181, you have defeated over 100. God's desire is not for status quo. He's to change people to number one in Jesus' name. Amen? Habakkuk talks about many things when he asks God so many questions and it seems God is silent. God gives him an answer. He asks again and God gives him an answer. God has power to change circumstances. Number three is that God is in charge or is in control of his church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, the Bible says, and Peter asked in a conversation that goes there, I want to paraphrase because of time. And God responds, Jesus responds and says, I will build my church on the rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church of Christ is sustained on the power of God. I know we have faced so many things, and people are saying, we are not seeing the Timothy in joy of the old days and many pastors are not making noise and many other things. I want to tell you that God who we preach in this place is a God that relates to his church. And his church, we, we talk about us as a body and us as where we congregate. This place has the power of God in connection. And we need to know that. He relates with us. He controls the church and his affairs. For us, we need to know that. That's why we gather every day and we need to submit to him. There are no gates of hell that will prevail against his church. So those three things I've mentioned. God has power to control the church. He controls circumstances. He controls as individuals. But what should be our response? What should be our response to this God? I was making this and I found that Paul, and actually the majority of this Paul except John, pens some great things that we need to do because we relate to God. Great things that you can do. And one thing he says is that if you actually understand your God, you can have great joy. We many people here, some of us are suffering from high blood pressure. So lazima mutunzwe vizuri, ukiongeleshwa mbaya itakuwa mbaya sana. Minamuna kasirika ngaraka. Sukari, ugonjwa ya sukari. Si sukari ya kulamba, ugonjwa ya sukari. Many of us here, I'll go through many things. But let's look at first Peter. I'll read all these scriptures quickly. What I came to realize, Paul says that you can actually have great joy. You can actually have great peace. You can actually have and understand your great position. You can actually have great hope. And you can actually have and you have great inheritance. First Peter chapter 1 verse 8. Paul writes this. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The word there, I don't know what your Bible says, the New Living Translation says, inexpressible joy. I want to suspect NIV says, great joy. And he talks about this to Peter. And he writes this letter. He had seen him that you need to know God and you have great joy. For many of us who are seeking happiness elsewhere, I want to tell you, when you know God's attributes, they will slap you and you laugh. You look like a mad person. Amen. You will have great joy in tribulations. They will beat you in the walk in the presence of God. And they will be annoyed because you are not. You will have great joy. You, will, you have never seen it. But he said there is an expressible joy when we know God. Next that I want to look at and I read again is Philippians Chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Paul again writes and talks about the great peace that we can harness when we relate with our God. The thing there is when we relate with God. So he writes this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. 
do not worry about anything. <laughs> I dared people in the first service I should not do it in the second service. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Now, I'm reading the Bible. Not even a, this is not a rhema word. This is now what we call the written word of God. And thank him for all he has done. Verse 7. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Remember, he has written that I want to know the power of your resurrection. God can give you great peace. There are many of us who don't have peace because of even some of you struggle in work. I was saying the last month I traveled until I got tired. I went to Murang. I drove to Murang at seven hours. I did ministry for three hours. I drove back. Then two days I was to be in Nairobi. I drove again and came back. Then we had to go to, to my Mahu again and I drove. I realized I'm tired. I was making these sermon notes. And then the Bible said, don't worry about anything. I say, God, I need some facilitations for some quick way of traveling. You know what I prayed for, Ed Agnes? I prayed for a chopper. <laughs> and then I read this Bible and said, tell God what you need. What I needed is a quick facilitation that I may go there. And say, thank him for what he has done. I was saved. And say, you will experience God's peace. But there are great things that we need to ask God. And stop troubling many things. Then I ask God that if you don't give me a chopper, just facilitate me that I enjoy this thing. What I want is peace. Amen. Some of you are struggling. And the Bible is telling you, don't worry about it. It actually says, don't worry about anything. Some of you are already worrying about my request. The Bible says, don't worry about anything. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You have little faith, so you have no great things. I dare tell you, this is the word of God. Ah, this is sweet, my brother, my sister. Now, there is another one here. If you want to be a senior pastor, you should know, know your great position. In John chapter 21, verse 12, Paul introduces to another way of knowing who you are. And I will tell you where this also inspired me when I was reflecting on this. In John chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, he, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. This may not make sense, even children who are here. But I was in an international conference, and one of the great speaker, man renowned across the globe, was speaking. He asked the audience to describe to him who he was. So one rose and he said, I know you are a bishop. One rose and said, I know you teach in the university, you are a doctor. Another one said, you know, I know you have written many articles. He said, all of you don't know me. And you are my brothers because these are gathering of brethren. There is a high position that I want to introduce to you to. I am a child of God. Amen. Now, this sounds good for those who don't believe in the chopper. That you have a great position as a child of God. Say amen. amen. But yet, we don't take this position very well. We misguide ourselves. When in the offices, we don't tell people you are born again. You say, I am a CEO. You know, I'm a senior pastor. You know, I'm a council of the elders. It's a good one. There are only seven. Wow. It's a good one. We are a child of God. And all people were amazed in a whole conference how the bishop disputed that they don't know him. And the new nomenclature of naming people now is Deacon Arena. You know you are Mr. Arena. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Deacon. They say SP, we're that is not the salutation. It is wrong. There is a higher position, a greater position. Praise the Lord. For us to walk in the presence of God, children of God, now children who say we are not children, even adults here, now I address you, children of God, the highest position is for you to know you have a greater position as a child of God. Amen. We need to respond in that particular manner, and that will give us the hierarchy of many things. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, sorry for my verse, says 1, 12 on the PowerPoint. I rectified it. Let's turn there. There is a great hope, great hope for the children of God. If you know God, you will not be people here who are fearing. In fact, I said, let me read this, then I tell you what I said in the past service. Uh, Titus chapter 2, 
verse 13, talks about great, I'm talking about great things for the great children of God, says this, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God, now God, great God, and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Great hope. There are some of us who have no hope for tomorrow. In fact, they say, when people are almost dying, the last thing they lose is hope. It's not money. The day you get there, and somebody tells you, now go and take care of my children. <laughs> hope is gone. Up on the other end. But there is a great hope here. In fact, it talks about glorious hope. I told the past, uh, the, the people in the past service, and you know, please, um, even the fear of death should not scare the children of God. For God delights in the death of his people. Now, you need to know this so that you don't die uh, when you are still struggling. So we just die in peace. Amen. There is only one death that scares God in the death of an unbeliever. Praise the Lord. This is the truth of the matter. The day we need to go. Many of you, my brother, my sister, you are here. There is a great hope for us that we will, our body may sleep. But there is a great hope for us. It says when it will be revealed, if you know God, you will have great hope. Hope, even if we don't have a job. I talked about God who changes the circumstances. That is the power of resurrection. You will walk in the presence of God. You earn little and life has gone up. There is hope, my brother. There is hope, my sister. Amen. You see your boss coming every day and say, can he see me? You are hopeless. I want to tell you there is great hope. I have that hope. Amen. I have hope. I have hope. I have hope the things that are looked dead, they will come to life. And this can only be if you know this God. He says, because you await his coming. Because if you are not a believer, you will not wait for his second coming. So a little thing makes you angry. There is great hope. No one can actually put you under. I said in the first service, no one can bury a star. For some of you, you are thinking you will be sacked. I want to give you one motto. Go and do the right thing and write it on your book. I want to do the right thing until I'm sacked. No one can sack you doing the right thing. Praise the Lord. You will never. That is a motto that I want to dare many of you. You're feeling being disturbed. Don't go and pay bad for bad. Go and do the right thing. And say, I want to be sacked doing the right thing. The few that I've seen on the newspapers, they were sacked like yesterday, they got the job tomorrow. Why? God has a, is a hope for them. Praise the Lord. There is great hope. Brethren, if we do the right thing, there is hope for us to walk in the presence of God. Great hope. Not just hope. That's here. Now this is where the, 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 the plan is. There is great inheritance. There is great inheritance. Praise the Lord. <laughs> When we walk in God and respond to him, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, talks about great inheritance. It surpasses what I've told you. Now look at this for those who have spiritual ears, so that you don't look at earthly things. I want you to know this. Children of God who are here, and all of us who are here, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He says, and we have a priceless inheritance. Look at this. It's more than what you have ever thought and asked. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. For you. Wacha kusema wacha niweke hii koti ni onane na ye. There is a great inheritance for you. Kuna ndege yangu kule. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is there. I will fly. Oh my goodness. Pure and undefiled. Beyond the reach of change and decay. There is great inheritance when we respond to this God. I said in the past service that, you know, good things are kept in good store cases. Like some of you who have gold, you know, gold is not just kept anywhere. Some of you keep it in the bank. Some of you keep it a place and you put security. Now, God has a great inheritance for us, the inheritance in heaven, that we need to access it. As you look at him as you relate to him, do not give up. One of my dangerous prayers that I prayed in the morning and I would dare pray it now. It will be bad for some of you because I don't know whether all of you will be in heaven and I miss it. 
I also want part of that in heaven. Praise the Lord. The great inheritance. It is stored. Imewekwa kwa Kiswahili. For you. We can miss it if we don't understand who God is. At one day when we close our eyes, many of us will not have what to say whether I will be in the book of life. There is a great inheritance if you know our God. It, the Bible says he has stored it for us in heaven. It is priceless. It is great. We can dare seek God if we know him and the power in his resurrection. Some of you have not known about this. We have come to church maybe because our spouses come to church. Some children could be here because your parent asks you, enter the car and let's go to church. Some of us could be doing whatever you do because people have. But the Bible says, and Paul says, and he yearns for the power in his resurrection. And later on, we see great things, the great inheritance, the great hope, the great position, the great peace, and the great joy in the Lord. Why are children of God suffering? Why are we suffering? We are the majority in the city of Nalia Lia. Why are we suffering, children of God? It's a great inheritance. You could be walking on feet. I want to tell you there is a plan that will make you joyful on that work. You could be lacking something to eat and drink. There is joy that comes from the Lord. You could have been talked about by people negatively, but there is joy. I find this is sweet for me. You need to follow this God. You need to ask like Paul that I want to know the power of your resurrection. The power of resurrection is because Jesus resurrected from dead. Did Jesus just resurrect? The Bible said, and because he was from God, God resurrected him. So he's able to bring every situation to life. And that situation will only be defined by the great word, the superlative term. I want to pray with you as you close your eyes. I don't know what God is speaking to you. I'm excited, not even about things, but I'm excited there is a God that gives me hope. It doesn't matter what people have said about you. It doesn't matter how you've got your feedback about the first month you have applied for job or promotion. There is something that God is saying, that the child of God, know me. I relate with you. It's not a scarecrow. I say to God, I have trusted you. I want to dare you and even seek you on great things. Just give you an example. Go and ask, say, ask anything. So long as you ask the right motive, God will grant to you. And I want to pray with some few people here who are partnered in it. So it could be sickness. Could be here, you are seeking God for an open door. It could be in this place. There is something you have never prayed about. You have taken it to be normal. People in your house, household are drunk at, and you think that is usual. No, God can only delight in you when you are born again. The great inheritance is for us when we possess something. I want you to come here, want to pray with you. You stand here in the gap for some of your people that are not born again. You are people in your family that are wayward. Some of them are struggling in marriage. Or it's just a behavioral thing that goes across the board. We want to pray with you. Because God says, ask. I am daring to ask God great things in Jesus' name.